Hi, I'm Tom Long. And you know who I wouldn't want to have been? Moses. He didn't want the job, but God put him in the middle between God and Pharaoh on behalf of the Israelites. Pharaoh was definitely not the person to go up against in those days. But amazingly, God fought for the Israelites and Pharaoh reluctantly let his slave labor force go free. But things didn't go any better for Moses. After a brief jubilation, the people he was leading through the wilderness to the promised land began to complain. One might go so far as to call it whining. They even got nostalgic about their days as slaves. But the children of promise came extremely close to getting a dose of the treatment God gave those who missed embarking on the ark. While Moses was on a mountaintop getting the Ten Commandments, God's people were making an idol for themselves and engaging in revelry, which made God furious. That time Moses successfully advocated for mercy toward them, but we see the upshot of all that in Exodus chapter 33, verse 3, when God says, Go up to the land flowing with milk and honey, but I will not go with you, because you are a stiff-necked people, and I might destroy you on the way. But Moses and the people had seen that God was with them as God showed his presence in a cloud by day and as a pillar of fire by night. Moses had many conversations with God. It was God who freed them, God who led them, God who fed them, God who gave them water time and again. But now they would no longer have God with them. In his anger, God was sending them on without him. Again, Moses intercedes on behalf of the people and of himself. Moses said to the Lord, You have been telling me, lead these people, but you have not let me know whom you will send with me. You have said, I know you by name, and you have found favor with me. If you are pleased with me, teach me your ways, so I may know you and continue to find favor with you. Remember that this nation is your people. It reminds me of David's repentant prayer in Psalm 51, where David said, Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Astoundingly, just as God had mercy on David, God acquiesces. He tells Moses, my presence will go with you and I will give you rest. Moses, perhaps feeling desperate, doesn't take yes for an answer. Once again, he asks God not to send them on without God being with them. And once again, God assures Moses that his presence will go with them. Strangely, Moses skips saying thank you and leaps forward to his next demand. Now, show me your glory. God might have shown Moses a clip of the Raiders of the Lost Ark scene, uh, showing what happens to people that see God's glory. It wasn't pretty watching their Nazi faces melt and then them dying in agony. But God was gentle with Moses and it explained that seeing his glory wouldn't be the joy ride Moses was expecting. As a consolation prize, God offers this. I will cause all my goodness to pass in front of you and I will proclaim my name, the Lord, in your presence. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But, he said, you cannot see my face for no one may see me and live. Then the Lord said, there is a place near me where you may stand on a rock. When my glory passes by, I will put you in a cleft in the rock and cover you with my hand until I have passed by. Then I will remove my hand and you will see my back, but my face must not be seen. For those of us who are very literalistic in our leanings, we can easily get sidetracked into thinking that God's face in this passage is like a human face. But to the Hebrews, the word for face, surface, or presence were all the same thing. 
So let's try not to get sidetracked here, but to understand that Moses desperately wanted to know that God was with him and that God granted that request to Moses. There are so many Psalms that express this same hunger and thirst to know that God is present in our lives, like Psalm 42, 1, where the psalmist cries out, As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, my God. But to my mind, the one that most echoes Moses' situation is Psalm 23's description of what it is like to know God is present when troubles surround us. When, from the perspective of the world, from outward appearances, we may have no hope. The game changer is the presence of God, our shepherd. The psalmist wrote, Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. What allays our fears when there are so many evil threats in our lives, we can't even see where the next bad thing is coming from. What comforts our troubled hearts and minds when we don't know how to move forward? For the psalmist, for Moses, for me. It's knowing that whatever I might lose, I will not lose God. God is faithful. God is present. No matter how much at a loss the psalmist may be to negotiate the path ahead, a path he can't even see in the darkness, he is comforted to know that God will guide him as a shepherd guides his sheep with his staff, and God will protect him from evil as the shepherd protects his sheep with his rod. Do I ever feel desperately fearful? Am I ever overwhelmed with anxiety? Yes. Yes, I am. But when I turn my focus toward God, when God opens the eyes of my heart to know that he is near, when I remember that I am not alone in my decision-making, but God leads me each step of the way, my fears subside and my heart finds rest and peace. If you are walking through that valley as dark as death, if fear and anxiety are swelling in your breast, as the song says, turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. Turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full in his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory.